Hello, welcome to uh, lecture number four on strengthening your marriage. We are continuing to build uh, an architecture, God's blueprint for marriage. Uh, this particular uh, part one of this lecture on communication is what we're going to go through now, and we will continue to unpack uh, what God's got to say. I would remind you, you might want to pause the video and download the handout so that you could take notes uh, during this section. But let's look, look to the Lord in prayer. Father, we understand that communication was drastically affected in the fall. Help us to learn how to be better and more biblical uh, communicators. We understand that we can talk for a long time before we start to communicate. So give us grace, Lord, as we slump towards trying to be better communicators, saying that which is good and right and edifying. Use our lips for good as a witness for the Savior than as a weapon for the serpent. We pray in the matchless name of Jesus. Amen. So we're looking at effective communication. It's often asked, what is the greatest cause of trouble in marriages and families today? You could probably answer that question on a couple of levels. The ultimate cause is sinful selfishness. It is a lack of biblical love. Ultimately, all problems in marriage can be traced to a lack of love, either a love for God or a failure to love others as we already love ourselves. This would be Matthew 22, 36 to 40, where Jesus summarizes all his law, and he says to love God and love your neighbor as yourself. So that's one level in which you could answer the question what the greatest cause of trouble in marriage and family is. But on a functional level, we would have to say it's poor communication. I've been doing biblical counseling for over 20 years now, and I've never counseled a couple or a family who were having problems and who were communicating effectively. Let me illustrate it this way. Picture yourself at the drive through of a fast food restaurant. You pull up to that little box, that microphone, and announce, I'd like two hamburgers, two fries, and two Cokes. And you hear back, now you want a hamburger, a cheeseburger, two fries, and two Diet Cokes? No. I said, and then you reply, I want two hamburgers, two fries, and two Cokes. Well, author Gary Smalley recommends that couples practice what he calls drive-through talking in a similar way. Take the time to repeat back what you think you heard your spouse or your children say. It is honoring and it's meaningful. With marital and family communication, remember that you're always trying to move forward toward the deepest level of intimacy. Healthy families are connected emotionally and spiritually and intellectually and physically. They feel connected. They feel safe in that connection. They can say things knowing that they won't be rejected or belittled. So don't forget to say, repeat that order please, as you practice drive-through communication. I think that you could probably write it down as a basic axiom. Wherever you find people who are experiencing harmonious relationships, you'll find people who are communicating effectively. And wherever you find people who are experiencing severe difficulties in their relationship, you will find people who are not communicating effectively. Good relationships are built and sustained by effective communication. Dwight Hervey Small in After You've Said I Do, a book on communication and marriage, says that communication is the heartthrob and the nerve center of a marriage relationship. Now I understand in our marriage counseling we've dealt with the whole blueprint for marriage done God's way and the husband's role and the wife's role and many people are just waiting till we get into this communication. Well as Harvey says that it's the heart throb and nerve. What happens when your heart stops? You're dead. So when communication breaks down, there's serious trouble. 
That's why we need to take some time to unpack and unfold how to do biblical communication. Jay Adams in Christian Living in the Home has a chapter titled Communication Comes First, where he says Christian communication is the basic skill needed to establish and maintain sound relationships. Even secular man sees the difference and the difficulty of communication in a relationship. Over 20 years ago, I read this report that when it comes to conversation, women want to re build rapport, but j men just like to report. And in the survey done, married women found that 57% think it's harder to get their husbands to talk than it should be. 58% think busyness interferes with marital conversation, and 81% said that they had told their husbands something only to have their husbands say that they'd never heard it." Unquote. So with what Dwight Harvey Small says and After You've Said I Do and what Dr. Adams says in Christian Living in the Home and his chapter on communication, saying how serious it is, you might think that these are strong statements. Maybe you think, uh, you might think that Small or Adams are exaggerating, but when we test those statements by God's word, we find that the Bible says this equally strongly that if we wanted to we could even find hundreds of verses in the Bible that stress the importance of communication biblical communication so I guess we ought to ask the question how important is communication in your relationships think for an example of the importance in Proverbs chapter 18 verse 21 Solomon says that the power of life and death are in the tongue. That's a pretty strong statement. The power of life and death are in the tongue. How about we reflect upon the teachings in Ephesians? Chapters 1 through 3, you've got your relationship with God. And chapters 4 through 6 is loving others. When you get when you get that applicational section, the latter half of Ephesians, chapter 4, verses 1 to 32, is verses that are pregnant on relationship. Verses 1 to 24 emphasize the importance of good relationships with all believers. But in verses 25 to 32, there are specifics of how these relationships are developed and maintained with the primary focus on communication. Ephesians 4, 29 and 30 talks about grieving the Holy Spirit. Jesus talks about the premium of words in Matthew 12, 37. By your word you shall be justified and by your words you shall be condemned. Proverbs 11, 9 says that you can destroy your neighbor with your mouth. In verse 11, that a wicked mouth can tear down a whole city. Do a study in Proverbs on the tongue. You're going to find in the next chapter, Proverbs 12, 18. There is one who speaks rashly like the piercing of a sword. In those days, you didn't have guns, but the most destructive personal weapon was a sword. Today, you've got repeater guns and the mouth that doesn't end. James weighs in on the tongue in James chapter 3. He says, stop being so many teachers. And after that, he compares the tongue to the poison of a snake, to a fire that destroys a whole forest that defiles the entire body and is set on fire by hell. It is a restless evil. It is full of deadly poison. That is what flaps behind our teeth. So what happens in a marriage relationship when husbands and wives don't communicate effectively? Well, you'll find some pretty unfortunate things occurring. For one, you'll find people whose relationship is very superficial and shallow. Some people don't want you to know them like an island that you circle and it's hard to get on. 
Proverbs 29, 17. 1 Thessalonians 4, 18. Encourage one with thanks. 1 Thessalonians 5, 11. Encourage one another. Build up one another. You'll find where there's no communication, people aren't being strengthened and built up. You'll find boredom setting in, where you're getting tired of each other, become dissatisfied. And that's all a setup for someone who will talk to your spouse and listen to them. Good conversation is the stimulus. Where good biblical communication is not taking place, where it's not being effective, you'll have wise decision making thwarted. Again, several proverbs speak to this issue. You're going to have husband, a husband who ignores his wife's counsel. Part of the one flesh means that you're making decisions together, not apart. Where there's not effective communication, there's confusion and disorder that occurs. Amos 3.3 3 speaks to this. Or how about uh, when, he, when he says, can two walk together unless they are agreed? 1 Corinthians 14, we're told that God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. There must be that communication taking place. What happens in a marriage relationship when husband and wives aren't communicating effectively? You're also going to have a person tempted to feel rejected and demeaned, where we think that they're not worth talking to. Issues remain unclarified. Someone says something you don't understand. You don't know what he or she means. Wrong ideas are uncorrected. Someone says or does something and you think they mean one thing when in reality they mean something else. How are you going to figure that out unless there is good communication going on? Where good communication is not taking place, apparent disagreements turn into conflicts. The word for this is assumption. And what do we assume about assumptions? Most of them are wrong. Jot down Joshua 22, verses 10 to 33. I'm not going to take the time to, to bore you by reading it to you. This is one of my favorite passages in the Old Testament that speaks to the issue of disagreements turned into conflict because of assumptions. You see, after the children of Israel conquered the land, part of the descendants of Reuben and Gad and Manasseh stayed on the other side of the Jordan. They set up what looked to the other people like a large altar. Those on the other side of the river are, are you know, they're scratching their head. They're, they're misunderstanding what the intention of building the altar was. They knew it was wrong. They almost went to war, but fortunate, fortunately they asked a question. Is this what you're doing? No, they weren't building an altar for sacrifice. It was an altar of remembrance. And so a whole war was prevented by stopping to ask a question and for clear communication to take place. For wrong ideas to be clarified. Finally, where um, a couple is not communicating effectively, conflicts remain unresolved. And the effect on the relationship is a, neg a negative one. Friends, we need to learn and grow in how to communicate effectively. It's a lifelong event. We understand that communication was drastically affected in the fall and that as sinners, it's very difficult to communicate. So with, with all that as a backdrop, I want to move on to give you a definition of what constitutes effective communication. Let's start building that definition where we understand that communication is not an event once done. No, it's ongoing. It's a process, a process of sharing information with another person in such a way that the sender's message is understood in the way he intended it to be understood. 
what this does look like in phone conversation is you might be talking for 20 minutes before you actually start communicating. Talking does not always equate with communication. We're talking about understanding the way the person intended what they are saying. Another way of saying it is the art of conveying information and meaning in order to come to a common understanding. It's not just conveying information, but conveying meaning. It involves sending the message clearly, but also receiving it accurately. It's a process of sharing information with another person in such a way that the people involved are mutually strengthened. They are enriched. They're encouraged. For instance, Ephesians 4.29 says, Let no unwholesome word proceed out of your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment. So if you're using this word process, not event, let me say it another way. That it's a process of sharing information with another person in such a way that the people involved experience harmony, unity, and emotional closeness. Ephesians 4.25 talks about how we are members of one another. This is how we get closer. Emotional closeness is built on effective communication. Where there's not effective biblical communication, there is not that emotional closeness. So there you have it, in general, a definition of what effective communication is. Wherever you have effective communication, these factors will always be present. Let me give you a little outline of where we're headed. An outline for effective communication. The sections would be number one, nonverbal communication. In nonverbals, we're talking about our actions and our behavior before we ever open our, our mouths. Number two, auditory communication. This is our listening practices. Again, this is before the mouth has been opened. So our actions and behavior, our listening practices. And number three, verbal communication, our words and our speech. Why is it this is an ongoing process that we're learning to do? Well, let me refer you to a couple who was leaving their marriage counselor's office and said, now that we have learned to communicate, shut up. Well, yes, the words were wrong, but I bet the uh, listening wasn't there along with the body language. Let's start with that first point. You'll get that later. Nonverbal communication are actions and behavior. This is also called body language or halo data. It's an aspect that is often overlooked. That's why when I do Skype or, or FaceTime counseling with people, I've got to be able to see them. I'm looking for, for body language. When you're having communication, you're watching the person. That is why texting and email is very poor communication because we, we cannot read body language and quickly ask them how they meant what they said. Let's look at uh, four facts about nonverbal communication. Letter A in your fill-in, it is important. Write down important. These are some biblical statements and illustrations that highlight the importance of nonverbal behavior. Notice your first reference there, Ephesians 4.28. A former thief communicates his change non-verbally by ceasing to steal and commencing to work and to give. You know, if, I, if I'm saying I love someone and yet I steal, those statements are incongruous. They are not parallel. If I say to my wife that I love her and my actions don't show it, we communicate powerfully in a negative way. When you steal, you communicate. When you work and give to needs, you are also communicating. John 14, verses 21 and 23. He who has my commands and keeps them, he it is that loves me. 
If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. You see, from Jesus' lips, nonverbal puts reality to the words. We say we love him, and we show it in our obedience. Matthew 7, 21 to 23. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, shall enter into my kingdom. He says, many will say to me. Maybe that's true of you. There's a lot of false converts. Matthew 7 is one of the scariest passages in the New Testament. It doesn't matter if you say you're a Christian, if all your deeds and characteristics and affections deny regeneration. Jesus asked a question this way in Luke 6, 46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Our words and actions must match. Notice Genesis 3, 7 to 10. Adam and Eve, after they sinned, they're hiding from God. They didn't say, Lord, we have sinned, but their actions spoke loud and clear. Genesis 4, verses 5 and 6, Cain became, Cain became very angry and his countenance was fallen. He didn't have to say a thing. He looked guilty. Genesis 32, 6, Esau is coming to meet you, Jacob, with 400 men. Here's a good one. In uh, Romans 5, 8, God commended, God demonstrated his love toward us, and that while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. Nonverbal communication, letter A, it is important. Letter B, fill in continuous. It is continuous. Now, this is true of God's communication. Jot down Psalm 19, verses 1 to 4, or look at the reference there. No bother to read it right now. The basic gist, the psalmist says that the heavens are declaring the glory of God. Literally, the heavens are narrating his glory, day after day, pouring forth speech. This is wordless communication in general revelation. All mankind everywhere, by virtue of creation, knows that there's a God. It is communicated very clearly without words. Also of us. We're always communicating. Notice some of the bullet points here. We're communicating with our eyes when we're refusing to look or we look in another direction. We're communicating with the expressions on our face, whether we're smiling or serious or angry. We communicate by the way we dress. Unfortunately, when I took my family to the river yesterday afternoon, there was some pretty horrid communication taking place by the way people we're communicating in their skimpy clothing. We communicate the way we sit or stand and where we sit or stand if we're standing away from somebody or our body posture when we turn away when somebody says something that we don't really care for. We communicate with what we do with our time. We take time for golfing or fishing and we have time for everything but our spouse. We communicate with our money. Show me a checkbook, I'll show you the condition of somebody's heart. The money, our money is a barometer of our heart. Where our treasure is, there with our heart be also. We communicate what makes us, by what makes us laugh. Do you think that uh, uh, crude jokes are funny? We communicate by willingness to help or not help. Or the way we help. We communicate by the way we listen or the way we don't listen. We communicate with our arms and our hands. We communicate by our presence or our absence, by our tears, our silence, our withdrawal. In other words, what did you fill in for letter B? We communicate all the time, even without our words. So in regards to uh, our Wordless communication is important. It's continuous. Letter C. It is powerful. 
powerful. Let me refer us to Romans 5, 8 again. God demonstrated his love toward us and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He powerfully spoke of the love of God for sinful man by dying. Titus 1.16 speaks of people who profess to know God verbally, but who deny him by their works, being detestable and disobedient and worthless for any good deed. Disobedience is is the strongest statement of non-belief. We show the condition of our hearts by how we behave. Letter D, it is often misunderstood, especially here in a fallen world. In Mark 4, Jesus and the disciples are out on the Sea of Galilee and Jesus falls asleep in the boat and they misinterpreted his sleep for not caring. But Jesus was the God-man. He experienced exhaustion just like every person on planet Earth. And they misinterpreted his sleepiness, sleepiness for not caring. Romans 2. Same scenario. People misunderstanding God's forbearance for inactivity. There's the example in 1 Samuel of Hannah and Eli. Or in Acts 2, on the day of Pentecost, people misunderstood. They accused the first saints of, of the church of being drunk. So, in conclusion on this one point, we need to be aware of how we come across. If you have questions, if you're confused about your spouse's nonverbal communication, please do not assume. Don't assume that you know ask. That's what humility does. Humility asks questions. Because your interpretation influences your feelings. Number two is our auditory communication. So we're moving from, we're moving from point one, body language, to our listening practices. Effective communication involves properly sending the message but also receiving the message you just like myself could give so many examples of times when we have sent a message clearly but others didn't accurately receive it probably a lot of us could think of times when someone else has said something to us but we partially or completely misunderstood this. I could give you so many examples of this in marriage or family or in pastoral ministry. Now, three questions about the listening aspect of effective communication. Question one, these are the three questions we're going to go down through. Number one is, why is good listening so important? Why should we be concerned about being good listeners? Then we'll deal with the what. What is good listening? What does it involve? And number three, how can good listening skills be developed? So in this first question, notice the why of letter A. Why is good listening so important? Why should we be concerned about being good listeners? Number one, Good listening is important because our triune God is a good listener. As in everything, he's our example. How about God the Father? 1 Peter 3.12 His ears attend to our prayers. Psalm 34.6 This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. Doesn't that minister encouragement to your soul? You'll notice the other references there. So, Psalm 116.1 or Psalm 139.4, Jeremiah 33.3, Malachi. But how about our Lord Jesus in John 14.24? The word which I speak isn't mine, but the Father's who sent me. 15.15, 15, all things 
I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. What about the Spirit? The Holy Spirit will bring to your remembrance everything I have said to you. John 16, 13. The Holy Spirit will not speak of his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak. You remember in Romans 8, verse 26, how we're told that we don't know how to pray as we ought, but the Holy Spirit makes intercession. Why is good listening so important? Because our triune God is a good listener as our example. Number two, God has told us to be good listeners. He's commanded us. This is our command. First of all, to listen to God. This is my son, listen to or obey him. Frequently in the Gospels and Revelation, we find this phrase, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. In James 1.19, we read that we are to be swift to hear, slow to speak and slow to wrath. So God has told us to listen to God, and he's also told us to listen to one another. Many times in the Proverbs, for instance, in Proverbs 18, 13, he who gives an answer, in other words, when we speak before we hear, it is folly and shame. God calls us a fool when we speak without hearing. So often somebody has told you well, you didn't tell me that. Really? Maybe they didn't listen. When we turn to the New Testament, that verse I'd already referenced in James 1, 19, be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Don't automatically tell somebody in your self-exalted pride that they didn't tell you something. Maybe you ought to ask them a question, or maybe you ought to posture yourself like, I'm not sure if you told me, maybe I didn't hear it. That's a statement I think humility would make. Number three of why good listening is so important. Good listening is a means of receiving grace and help. First of all, from God. Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing by the word of God. It's also a means of receiving grace and help from other people. Ephesians 4.29 It gives grace to those who hear. Oftentimes in Proverbs 19, Proverbs 15, listen to counsel. We are not islands of righteousness. The whole brain trust does not reside in us. We need counsel from other people speaking into our lives. That's why we need godly relationships in the local church. Good listening is a means of receiving grace and help, both from God and from other people. Number four, good listening is necessary for good speaking. Good listening helps us know what and how we should say things to people. Ephesians 4.29, speak what is good, because good speech edifies. It ministers grace according to the need of the moment. We can't know for sure what the need of the moment is unless there is this taking place. You know, we, we read in John 2, only God knows what's in man's heart. I'd already read for us from Proverbs 18.13. We can't answer wisely without first hearing well. But then too, good listening is necessary for good speaking in that it encourages the other person to open up. Our listening communicates concern. One of the most valuable gifts we can give somebody is our time and listening. 
Right of Proverbs says in Proverbs 20, verse 5, the plans of a man are like deep waters, but a man of understanding will draw them out. Listening is part of that process of drawing out of people. On occasion, I've had the experience of speaking to groups or individuals who were not quite so into what I was saying. They were inattentive. And I gotta say, it's difficult for me as a speaker in those situations. But on other occasions, I've had the good fortune to speak to groups or individuals who are very attentive. You can't give them enough Bible truth. They hung on every word of what was taught them and counseled them. A fifth reason, good listening is a way of promoting good relationships. Psalm 116, 1, I love the Lord. And then he goes on to give the reason. He could have given a lot of reasons. And he does in other Psalms, but here in Psalm 116, 1, because he hears my voice in supplication. Doesn't that just amaze you that God listens to us and how that fosters the relationship? Good listening fosters good relationship. It's one of the most important ways of keeping that love affair with our spouse going. There's hardly anything that will be a greater deterrent to a good relationship than an unwillingness to listen. We do not turn our good ear to the pillow at night and give our spouse the deaf ear. Conversely, there is hardly anything that is more important in promoting and sustaining a good relationship than good listening. Proverbs 23, 22. Listen to your father who begot you and don't despise. Listening is the opposite in that proverb of despising. If you don't listen, you're showing contempt and you're demeaning the person. I could tell you of person after person who became involved in an extramarital affair because they met somebody who listened to them and showed that sincere interest, not to give them an excuse for their sin. Good listening promotes good relationships in other ways. It helps people to get to know each other. Genesis 2.24, this is part of the one flesh relationship. Basically, you don't get to know the other person while you're speaking but while you're listening. Proverbs 23, 6 and 7. Don't eat the bread of a selfish man or desire his delicacies. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. If you really want to get to know somebody, you got to know what's going on in their heart. And how do you know what's going on in their heart unless you're open and honest and listen to that? Paul asks a question in 1 Corinthians 2.11. Who knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit which is in him? Notice the sixth and final point. Good listening is a way of serving other people. Good way of serving. It's one of the greatest way we can serve the saints. As Christian, we're called to serve other people. Mark 10, verses 43 to 45 Jesus says, whoever wishes to be great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be great will be the slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Now, there are a lot of ways to serve the brethren. By helping meet needs, doing things for other people. But one very simple yet overlooked means is listening. In Job 21, 1 and 2, Job, listen carefully. Let this be your way of consolation. What was God doing there? If you want to help encourage somebody, listen to them. So the question, are you a really good listener? It's important. Our triune God is our example God commands it. It's a way of receiving help. It is necessary for good speaking. It promotes good relationships. And sixthly, it is a way of serving one another. So we just answered the first question, why is good listening important? The next video will continue with question two.